What is up, everybody? Chaz Pippet here with CP Live, which is our working title now. Uh, we're going to wait just a second to get a couple people in here. We're super excited uh, to have you today, and I'll introduce my guest here in just a second. So just so you know, we usually start about the 90-second mark, trying to get some people in here. Um, Sounds good. So, Sounds um, good. Welcome, welcome. We're gonna let a couple people stroll in. We appreciate you joining us. Thank you all for coming. We're gonna get started about 30 seconds. You guys just hang tight for me. All right. Welcome everybody in to Chaz Pippet Live. That's our working title right now. If you have any suggestions for what we should call this, put it in the chat, please. Um, I am joined by Kurt Hughes, the founder of Ignite Baseball in Arlington, Virginia. Kurt is somebody I've known for quite a long time, and I wanted to catch up with him because his business, Ignite, is doing some really amazing things with not just hitting, but pitching and throwing. So Kurt, tell us a little bit about Ignite. Um, how you started it, and really your genesis to becoming the hitting instructor and the baseball instructor you are. Yeah, so uh, so originally uh, I'm from Vermont, um, so not a very great baseball state and pretty small. Uh, played in college, uh, was a biology and uh, chemistry major in college. Uh, I graduated, moved down to the D.C. area just because there's more jobs and that type of thing than where I grew up. And uh, I got a job at the Food and Drug Administration um, as like my after school job and started coaching travel baseball on the side and just kind of like fell in love with, you know, hitting and the whole thing. And I I thought that the people that I was like around uh, weren't really teaching uh, hitting using any type of science whatsoever. Um, I'd been kind of looking into like hitting stuff for a while to that point and and you know, uh, baseball rebellion has been like one of my, my bigger influences. You know, I've been reading their articles for, for years at this point, just kind of like quietly never commenting on anything or anything. And then, uh, I read one article. I don't remember which one it was. Um, and at the time I was, I was like considering going to school to get my PhD in either, uh, biomedical engineering <laughs> or chemical engineering. One of the two, I was like taking really? classes. Prep really easy stuff easy stuff right there good you know one or the other no big deal. yeah yeah whatever and uh i i kind of was between making a decision of like whether i was going to do that or i was going to like start this baseball business to try to fill this need that i thought existed and uh so i hit up chaz and i like was like said something in an article i don't remember and he's like hey let's talk more so we talked um and i basically was like hey i'm thinking about quitting my job um and like starting this business like clearly this is something that you've uh done before uh do you think i'm crazy and basically jazz was like yeah maybe uh <laughs> kind of tried to talk me out of it a little bit um well put you know, yourself in my shoes there kurt like you're yeah. talking about leaving a phd program when we're, we're, we're talking about like you know you were selling cars like this is not that there's anything wrong with that but i right. mean you, you had a real path to becoming a doctor you know, that's a different deal. Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, my parents thought I was crazy, too. Um, but, yeah, you know, it's like one of those things where you, if you're passionate about something, you just kind of don't stop working on it. And then you end up figuring it out. And, you know, that was 2014, I think. And, you know, now we're 2021. And, you know, so seven, seven years later and, you know, Ignite is doing really well. So, uh you know, I, I will always be thankful to Chaz and to the guys at Baseball Rebellion for kind of like helping kind of give me like some kind of structure to get like 
my like professional life started. Like I just didn't like, I kind of didn't know how to take like the first step forward and like how to like handle lessons properly and all that kind of stuff. So some of that like early like baseline stuff, like Chaz mm -hmm. is like a, a huge influence in and still is, right? I mean, like we have, I don't know, uh, shameless plug for Chaz. Like we have like a, a bunch of Rebel Racks in the facility. We use a bunch of their stuff and the stuff works. So like, and uh, you know, I honestly, everybody that comes in our building owns basically get, I tell them to get a Rebel Rack and I purposely don't. And just to be transparent, like I purposely like haven't bought them in bulk from you Chaz to sell them because I think that like from an ethical perspective, I can't give them a true recommendation if I'm making money off it. So I don't enough. do that. So like on any product, if I'm like, you should get this, I'm not going to profit on it. It's like a thing that we've done as our business and it seems to work quite well. And the reality is, is like all of our guys use that stuff and it works. That's awesome. I, you know, I, and obviously I appreciate it. I mean, I've known you for quite some time at this point and I remember you, you know, coming down numerous times, you stayed at my house at one time and mm -hmm. you got to see Manny Ramirez hit, I believe. I mean, yeah. that was pretty sweet. So, I mean, I've, I've kind of let you behind the curtain some, um, you know, obviously I can rub some people the wrong way occasionally, and I try not to do that as best I can, but you know, how, how has your experience been not just communicating with me, but with, with other instructors in the industry, right? I mean, a lot of people, you know, are, are pretty closed minded in this business and they don't want to share secrets. They don't want to actually help you grow. Um, right. Whereas, whereas I really do, and I have shown that repeatedly with people that actually reach out. So who are some other people that you've talked to and, and that have tried to help you? And you don't have to call anybody out that, that did not but I know there, there's some of those too. Uh, yeah. I mean, like, like Jeff Leach, fantastic dude. Um, I've talked with him multiple times about kind of the way this whole thing goes. Um, to be honest with you, I try to not. I try not to engage too much because I know that that's kind of how it goes. I kind of just like put the stuff out there that, that I think is the best. And if people like it, great. And if they don't, like, I just don't care. You know, like some people that are, I'm, I'm, I just, I don't want to get like the clickbait and buzz or whatever. So like, I'm not going to say names, but like some people that like do like more like polarizing stuff, you know, on Twitter or other social media stuff. I just like, sometimes they'll like comment on our stuff and I just like, I just don't respond. I'm just like, whatever. Like, yeah. I mean, like, obviously there's a logic behind what you're trying to do. Like, cool. Obviously there's a logic behind what we're trying to do. We think it's very well thought out. It's basically all I think about for, you know, the times when I'm awake. So it's like, whatever. I don't, I don't care what they think. It's no big deal. Well, kind of touching on that, I mean, when you do this full time and you really dive in and you and you're willing to, to stick your neck out there and go, you know, brick and mortar and, and go for it, um, you kind of have to have almost like an obsession. You know, you have to be so committed to being successful that there is no opportunity for failure. You know, and you have to make sure that you spend the time in the right areas to gain an informational advantage over the people that you're competing against, whether it's locally or nationally or internationally, it doesn't really matter. So what, what would you say has gotten Ignite to the point where like, you're about to go through a big expansion? Talk about that. Oh yeah. I mean, we already did. Like it's, it's dark right now. I just kind of flip my computer around. Like that, this is like, maybe you guys can't see it that well, but this is like our upstairs, like throwing area. We have like another awesome. weight room and everything kind of over in the corner over there. And then we have the whole downstairs as well. So we already did that. That happened in September. So we're already. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't realize you were in your facility. I thought you were at your house. No, man. I just, I, I was working till like nine. So I just kept it rolling. You can you see know, like funny. Have the screen recorder thing where I'll do videos in front of behind me. And then my landlord, like, like the travel or whatever. So he had like a map there that I haven't taken down yet. Or maybe I'm just going to put like little marks where people have come from the train. Like you guys do. I don't really know, but. No, you absolutely should. Whatever. Man. I didn't put it there myself. It was just already there. So it's a nice yeah, you, don't, you don't have to buy a map now. That's great. Yeah, well, good. Obviously, congratulations on the on the Thank you, man. I thought that was happening. I didn't realize that already happened. Yeah, so like Tyler, like your boy Tyler that did your did your net and everything. Like he's done both of my build outs. He did the one 
he did this one in uh in September. So he came through like September. Man, I, I, I bug that guy and say, hey man, hey, taking all these referrals, man. I need yeah, to that. yeah uh, he's, uh, he's a good dude. He did a really good job. They're, they're awesome. Um, but yeah, anyways, yeah. yeah, we did that. Um, I forget what the question was. We got a little derailed, but I think it was about like like you know, what has led you to being able to expand? Like what what has gotten you from like I'm starting this, I'm like outside, I'm trying to figure this out to like now I got my building and then now I'm doubling my size because yeah. you're obviously making enough revenue to do that. Like what are you doing differently in Arlington, Virginia that's allowing you to be so successful, Kurt? Yeah, I mean, I think like in the beginning when I first started doing this, I was very much like looking exclusively to because uh, hitting was like my passion it still is um looking to like hitting people to like guide me to be like who is the smartest hitting guy i'm gonna find that person and i'll try to like learn as much as i can like to to be as close to that as i can possibly be but then i got to a point where it was like well i've like read like a lot of things i've seen as many videos as i'm gonna see and then i was like all right well like hitting really is like a movement. So like, I think maybe like the fruit that's kind of on this vine is not necessarily through people that like are teaching hitting. It's going to be more people that are doing other stuff like posture restoration, like um, gate mechanics, like um, physical therapy, like that kind of stuff. So I kind of got started going down that rabbit hole, like probably like three months before we opened the facility. And from that point on, my goal has been kind of like to understand a human movement at like a much higher level. And then when you get to that spot where you start understanding human movement and you can, you can kind of apply it to other things. It's right. So we, we did the hitting, we're still doing the hitting and we've built like a pretty robust, like decision tree model that governs everything that we do. Right. Like if the hitter is not sliding their pelvis forward, um, like during their stride, like we can't do anything else. That's the most important thing. Once that's figured out, then it's like, okay, now we're going to focus on like rotating the pelvis and segmenting that away from the rib cage. And then like other things like build upon that. And if we don't get the first couple things, like nothing else matters. So like, that's what we're doing. So we built that for hitting. It's been really functional, works really well. And then it was like, all right, well, I need to build the same thing for throwing so I can, we can train staff. Like we know like what we're doing on that, that regard. And I got way down the rabbit hole with like my business partner. Like I would say like when we first started, he was much more like throwing than me. I didn't really know that much about it, but I kind of was able to learn a lot more about it because of like the movement stuff I was learning coupled with his knowledge about like more standard things that pitchers have done. So I think me looking in different spots than just like where everyone else is looking, I think has been honestly the the biggest thing and the, and the system, like systematizing stuff. So it actually like we have a process to which we approach things because what I found is that like, and I'm sure that you found this too, Chaz, it's like, if you build a business, like you built baseball rebellion, if it's just like the entire business is people want to come to do lessons with Chaz, that's a hard business to manage because you have a family, like, you can't work 90 hours a week. Like all of these things are true. Oh, you, oh, you can, you can, you it's can, but fun. like, it's not healthy. So yeah. you try to, you try to not do that. And my wife right. would definitely not be happy if I did that. So that's been my things, I think. That's cool. So you're exactly right. I mean, building systems is extremely important, but I want to be super clear Building systems and under and I'll speak for myself and then I'll ask you building systems at baseball rebellion is not about cookie cutting. It's about establishing a foundation that variation can stand on. Oh, and yeah. I think a lot of people really struggle with that in baseball and softball because the, the in vogue style of teaching right now is let's make everything as hard as we possibly can. Let's make it chaotic and then let the hitter figure it out or the thrower figure it out. And unfortunately, if they don't have a strong base and understanding of how they're supposed to move correctly, if they have a healthy, uninjured body, then then that really it just breaks them down and makes them survive instead of thrive. What do you think of that? I totally agree. I, I akin it to like like building a bridge. Like if I build a bridge and I'm not really sure how stable it is, I'm not going to drive an 18 wheeler over it. 
like I'm going to make sure that bridge is like really reinforced. We have all those pieces together before I like drive that really heavy truck over it and like crazy pitch pressure right off the bat or, you know, like, you know, random practice or whatever, which is not like, I'm not saying random practice is wrong. I think that like when people think about like random practice and block practice, people are like, well, obviously random practice is better. And it's like, it's better at times. It's not always better. Once, once we have that foundation, like you said, like that really strong bridge, we can drive anything over it and we're good to go. But until that time, yeah, I totally agree with you. We want to have the foundation of the way the athlete moves before so they can handle that. Well, we don't want to skip steps, right? I mean, it's really easy to to go right into group training and have kid, you know, loud music and everybody's screaming and and it's it's fun, but we want to make sure that the, the player is prepared for the variations and the variables, because if you just throw a bunch of variables at a, at a novice player or a player who has a massive rotational deficiency, even if they've been playing baseball or softball for years, they're not going to even have the opportunity to solve the problem of the variables that their brain and their bodies are incapable. And what I, what I kind of compare that to is if, you, if I have a novice player and I just hand him a bat or her a bat, and I immediately start shooting balls out of a machine at them at, at decent velo- game speed velocity relative to their age, yep. they're going to end up in tears. You know, right. I mean, they're going to fail so much that we're past the point of, you know, productive failure, which is the in vogue thing. And especially when you're wa- when you're talking to uh, or listening, tweeting, whatever, reading, consuming, you know, professional coaches, meaning, I'm in double A or I'm in the big leagues or whatever. Right. They're dealing with elite movers. They're dealing with elite movers. We generally are not. We're dealing with young, underdeveloped um, p- players who have more screen time than time in the field. So it, it, you have to understand what information you're consuming and realize the type of player that that person generally works with. And in our industry, I, I mean, I, the other day I had a 57 year old men's league player. Then I had a six year old, then I had three div- division one athlete females. And then I had a professional athlete baseball player followed by another seven year old. Like right. you got to shift gears, you know? Yeah. It's uh, I think, and that's the, the biggest challenge of the whole thing. It kind of goes back to like, making a decision like as I mean, for you as a person and for me as a person, but as a company about like, what are the things that are most important? Like, I think a lot of times people will fixate on things that like, either don't matter or only matter like some of the time versus things that like, actually like, make, like, make swings like good or make swings bad or make like a throwing motion good or make a throwing motion bad. And back in like my chemistry days, we used to call that overfitting. So like my, my job, I don't want to get too in the weeds about the chemistry stuff, but my job before is I used to build computer models that would predict whether a, um, like an impurity from a drug or whatever would be toxic based on its chemical structure. Right. And they would use these, these type of models called, partial least squares regression. And basically what it would do is like, it would dump this model in and it'd be like, okay, what pieces do this, this chemical have? And like, because of those pieces, we're going to make a decision about whether we think it's going to be toxic or not toxic. And like the way I think about swings is kind of the same way. It's like, what pieces does that swing have? And when we kind of like dump it down into this thing, it's like, okay, does that thing have enough pieces where the swing is going to work? Or does that thing have enough pieces or not enough pieces where the swing isn't going to work? And when you start doing that, what it it makes you do, like as an instructor, and I'm sure you've done this to some degree, is you cleave out things that like don't matter. It's like, okay, like, for example, I'll go like, um, like barrel tips, a good example. Like I have guys that we train that like they can't hit velo unless they barrel tip. Cool. No problem. I also have a lot of guys and girls that we train that hit velo fine and can elevate velo fine without a barrel tip. So it's like 
do I really care if you barrel tip? If you can smash the ball off velo consistently? Nope, don't care. But if you can't, then like maybe we'll introduce it. But like, you know, you talk about <clears throat> being non-invasive. We talk about that as well. When our instructors decide to do like what drills they're going to do, it's all dependent on like we're going to pick the least invasive thing first. We'll try that. If that doesn't work, we'll go slightly more invasive. And we literally have an order of basically drills. That it's like this is the one that like is not invasive at all. This one's really, really invasive, and you may need to use it at some point, but it can't be your first thing. Real quick, give an example of a non-invasive drill. Yeah, so like when I talk about it, I use, say like the like the Photoshop rule. Like if you can look at it and you could just Photoshop something out of the picture and you could be like, yeah, that person is hitting a ball or doing a rotation, then it's non-invasive. So one that we use a lot, we call step over the ball. I'm just going to all back up and show Yeah, you. show us. Show us. Can you guys see the ground or no? Uh, yeah. Okay. That's, that's fine. Yeah, I can see your feet. My head in this. So yep. imagine you have a ball on the ground. I wouldn't use a baseball because someone might roll their ankle. But let's say I have a ball on the ground like this. If I want someone to learn how to transition, how to slide their pelvis forward so they can create stretch across their oblique sling, like I first need them to get their pelvis to do this in some degree. Whereas that front side of the pelvis is going to lift up a little bit. And by stepping over the ball, it's really simple because the way that most people want to lift their leg is by using their entire lateral line. So that hip is generally going to come up. That doesn't always happen. It happens like 85% of the time. But like this would be non-invasive. So I just put the ball there. I toss the person or throw batting practice to the person or do a rack turn. I'd step over the ball, hit it. You know, like you Photoshop the ball out. It looks like a normal swing. Yeah, no, I, I totally get it. That's a great example. So um, obviously the way we do that here at Baseball Rebellion and Softball Rebellion is we mostly use rack turns there, right? So what I do we try to do as few drills in my lessons as possible. So I do front toss, I do BP, I do machine work. That's kind of what I do. Yep. And then because if I can't fix the, the general problem with that stuff, I feel like I've probably allowed them to have a rotational deficiency that I can fix elsewhere. And, and I can fix it standing in their stance with a hinge through side bend with speed. And then that allows them to go, okay, I can do this move. And then they just implement it. Um, we had a question from uh, somebody about facility business stuff. So Kurt, the trick in this business is scalability. How would you say you grew Ignite without being married to the facility? Well, I mean, a part of it is the fact that I have like, great people that are that are working with me and that like <clears throat> we have thought really really hard about the way that we like the way that we like set things up and that like so for example i don't know how your guys stuff works like you can't sign up for a lesson with kurt like you just can't like you go on ignite baseball like on our website and sign up and you work with we not me like you sign up it's like you book downstairs a a hitting lesson downstairs b a hitting lesson downstairs see a hitting lesson now before the day starts kind of like a doctor's office like we sit down and for like somewhere between a half hour and 45 minutes we sit down with everybody's notes and we have like a google form sheet where we just drop all the notes in so we can kind of see what everyone's done up to that point they're time, time stamped all that and we kind of like lay out a plan for the day similar to the way that like doctors and nurses would like before a day starts and they're like these are the, the patients that are coming in here's what their deficiencies are we walk through like what what are the plans to be able to address those things? And then we go do it. So it's like, I don't really, I mean, I teach like, I mean, I see almost all of our lessons that we do, but I teach maybe like somewhere between three and five a week now. And our results have never been better. So what do you do with your time? I mean, I work on like business systems and try to like build, like, like we're, I mean, I don't wanna like say, exactly what we're working on like right now because there's it hasn't like a hundred percent started but we might be doing some like an online training thing at some point where we like do like a like a course of some kind um but then also like you know i was building out the pitching program i needed to staff up our you know our our throwing program and like build like our entire strength infrastructure because like our upstairs thing the whole thing that we're doing is 
arm care plus strength. So it's like the first half is dedicated to more like throwing related stuff. And the second yeah. half is, is dedicated to strength training. And like, I, we don't do strength training the way other people do strength training. It's just a lot different. Like it's totally sure. like, it's just, I don't even know how to describe it. It's, it's way different than what most people do. And I would say that like the thing that's most different about the way we do strength training is that, is that like it's <clears throat> more rotational in nature and respects the way that the body actually moves and not just like, let's just pick up a bunch of weight because that's what I guess people want to see. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't understand this. Yeah. I mean, uh, around we have to do that, right. Cause like people are going to go to colleges and they might get hurt if we don't teach them how to do a deadlift safely or something like that. So I don't want the, I just want to say that before we move on. Sure. I don't want the message to be that like, we don't do any like deadlifts or squats or whatever, but it's limited and we more teach them how to do it in a safe thing. That's not like the bread and butter of the program, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. I, I listened to a guy speak the other day and just because I'm talking about him, I'm forgetting his name, but I was on his, his website and basically he said he wants to, to figure out what the athlete needs to do in real life and then train them to be able to do whatever that is in real life super well. And that doesn't necessarily mean you need a 500 pound deadlift and a 300 pound bench press and a 36 inch vertical jump and a 10 foot broad jump. Like I've never broad jumped on a baseball field at all. And I was super, a super good run jump, strong athlete. And I didn't do, I didn't get anywhere near my potential because I didn't take the time or have anybody show me how to rotate and how to rotate at different angles and how to rotate from hinge to side bend and up through. And yeah. so that's kind of, I assume what you're talking about specifically on the hitting side is like, you have to be functional inside of the demands of the athlete's sport. So for instance, a uh, football player's functional demand, if they're an offensive lineman is radically different from a wide receiver. Well, in baseball, if you hit or throw, you are massively rotational. And if you are deficient in something with how you understand, train, or execute your rotation, you are in massive trouble. And you will eventually max out much sooner. If you can't do that, you will hit the wall. And, and the other thing too is that like a lot of times like people are not training like what we've evolved to do. Like humans from an evolutionary perspective were evolved – to walk, run, and throw. Those are the things that we're evolved to do, basically. And like when we walk and when we run, there's certain patterns that happen like every single time. And like almost nobody's training respects the way that like humans actually like walk and run. And I, I don't want you guys to hear this and think, you know, Kerr from Night Baseball thinks that like baseball players should like run distance. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is that when people run, the arm that's in the lead always pulls the arm that's trailing always pushes and the trunk always rotates towards the, the lead leg that's true in hitting that's true in throwing <clears throat> that's true in walking that's true in running and like it's our goal like at ignite with our training to design like almost all of our training exercise exercises to respect that and to basically do that like on almost every single thing we do so if we're training a press, we're also like rotating towards our lead leg and pulling with our lead arm. If we're training a pull, we're reciprocating that with the other side of our body because that's what humans do. That's a really interesting way to think about it. I really like that. Um, Kurt, you mentioned before that you're doing some really cool throwing stuff. Can you talk a little bit more about your, your throwing program and how that's really, really different than, than what's around you in Arlington? Yeah, so we we use pulse a lot, which if you guys don't know what that is, it's like a sensor that goes in your arm and kind of wraps around. It used like, to be called Modus. Yep, driveline bot is called pulse now. Um, and uh, what it does is it tells us, this, I mean, it tells us a lot of things. I don't want to get too in the weeds in that because there's a, I could go all day on it. But I think there's the thing that like makes what we're doing quite unique is that we've developed what we call an ignite efficiency score. And I don't know if we're the first one to do this. So I don't want you guys to hear this and think like I'm claiming that like we're the only person to do this, but essentially every throw 
it's going to give you a readout of how many Newton meters of stress you're going to put on your elbow, basically. And when you divide that number by the miles per hour of velocity that person throws, it spits you out a decimal. And that decimal, because like efficiency by definition is how like is being able to do the most with the least effort, right? If we can get a lot of velo with a little stress, then obviously that's really, really good. So the lower that decimal gets, the closer to zero it gets, the better off we are. And it also gives us kind of like a decent, now no biomarker on this stuff is perfect, but a decent biomarker as far as like, okay, like do we think that this athlete can push and gain their velo in a healthy way? Um, and the answer is like, if that number becomes like above like, like 0.7, then we get a little scared and we're like, I don't know if this, I don't know if this athlete can grow in a healthy way. So for us as a company, when an athlete comes in and they have like a 0.7 or a 0.8 or a 0.9 as their efficiency score, our first goal, no matter what that athlete thinks so as, a, as a responsible company, it's our first goal to help drive that efficiency score down to a more man manageable number before we push. Everybody right. wants like these big velo gains and stuff like that. And don't get me wrong. I want them too. like, I'm not saying we should throw slow, but like we want to put health first. It's like, if you had to cut down a cherry tree and like you had an ax and it was dull, would you spend all day banging the cherry tree with a dull ax or would you spend all day sharpening the ax? I think you would do the latter you sharpen well, the hopefully you sharpen the axe and you just have to have somebody who knows how to sharpen it and that's kind of where professional instructors come in right i yeah. mean you you know you, you can give somebody data and if they don't know how to interpret it or, or action take action to change it then you know then what's the point i mean there's plenty of people that can identify a mechanical flaw in a hitter or a thrower but there's very few who can take action to actually change it and kurt at ignite baseball and his team are definitely some of those people. So I love the idea of an efficiency score for throwers. I think it's great. I mean, I founded a uh, delivery value system with Justin Orndorff years ago, which is essentially does that same thing just through mechanics. You know, my guy used to work for me. Mitch works for Justin. Oh, there. really? Yeah. Mitch Thanks, Aker. Man. He worked for me for like two years. And then That's awesome. he he's working for Justin now. He's the, I guess he's the, I forget the actual title. I'm going to say it wrong. He's going to be mad at me. But he's like <laughs> he's the director for the whole USPB. Yeah, well just just say he works for Justin, then he can't be mad. There we go. Uh, Perfect. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Justin obviously does some cool stuff with that, and you guys too. We had a question earlier from uh, Coco Fifteen Baseball Boys. So basically, he had a question about if you get into bad habits, how long can it take to fix them? So, Kurt, what what would you say to to him? Well, it depends on like what your bad habit is and how hard you work to develop that crappy habit. Yeah. If you if you were working for years to, to develop a habit that you just found out like is not good, like it's gonna take you a lot more time to like pattern that out. So I tell people all the time, if you've been professionally coached into a bad pattern, that's a bad deal. You know, one, it's a bad investment from the parents. I feel so bad. People come in here and they've had tens of thousands of dollars of lessons and their swing is junk. And they rotate terribly. And then in four weeks, they're up eight miles an hour. And they're like, how is this possible? You know, and it's like, well, you, you paid a lot of money for some really bad information. And sorry. Um, sure. but, it, but, you know, some, some kids, if they haven't been professionally coached into bad habits, it's they can actually grow really, really fast and make gains really, really quickly because they haven't heard all these millions of buzzwords and done millions of drills that really work against what they should be trying to do from a human movement perspective. 100%. And like, I think one of the things that really helped me with that, so I just hopefully give you guys like a little nugget of like an info with like breaking those old patterns. I, so we're all TPI certified here. We do that with all our guys. Um, and one of the things that uh, was part of like that hitting and pitching course, I forget exactly what it, what it was, but, um, Greg Rose was talking about how humans are, are really, really good at learning new movements, but they're really, really bad at changing old movements. So when you just, the way you speak about the movement, we found that has like a tremendous amount of effect and like how, how much better people get and how quickly they're able to break old habits. So like 
if you think of like you're changing your old swing, it's going to take a long time. But if you think that like I'm going to like I'm going to do my new swing, then it's a lot quicker. And like actually having athletes like label that and put labels on, they take their swing and you like, you know, you're taking front toss or VP or, or whatever, they take their swing and you have them call out whether it's their old swing or their new swing. We found that that works really, really well. So try it, it might work. No, that's a, that's a, that's an excellent, um, excellent thought. We say all the time, it's not just about learning new moves. It's about forgetting old moves. hundred percent. And you know, we want your body to like absolutely forget how to turn slowly or how to turn. Shout out, shout out to Steve Woda, by the way, my guy just commented on the right there. Woda, what's up? Thanks for being here, Steven. Yo, uh, his son, Jack, by the way, he's a 2026, uh, number two player in Virginia for perfect game. Wow. Good yeah. job. That's yeah. great. He's a stud. That's awesome. Um, I mean, I've even sent guys to you and, and uh, yeah, Mike Cohen, man. He's right. He's yeah. playing college ball, college ball yeah. now. I mean, I was trying to help him virtually. Right. And, and yep. we made the decision that he needed to find somebody in person and you were much closer than me. And I would, and honestly, and this is, this is true. And this is why Kurt's on anybody in, in Virginia that's, that's further away from us or wants a second opinion. I mean, I definitely think you should go to ignite. Um, you know, my own sons are eight and four. I'd have no problem with Kurt work with my own kids. Um, and that's the same way I feel about my instructors here. Um, and, and honestly, if Kurt tells me that his guys are just as good as he is, which I know they are, they wouldn't work there, then I'd feel comfortable with them working with him too. So, um, you know, I feel, I feel hundred percent confident in telling anybody in the Arlington, Virginia area, DC area, Baltimore, um, if you don't feel like making a seven hour drive, six hour drive down to see me, you know, feel free to, uh, check in on ignite and, uh, tell Kurt Chaz sent you and he'll make sure you get what you need. Okay. You know. Um, we're going to wrap this up, man. I really appreciate it. Uh, live with Chaz Pippen was brought to you by learn to turn, learn to turn is my new book. I really hope you check it out. Kurt actually, uh, bought a copy. So I'm excited to hear what he has to say about it in the future. And, you know, a lot of people think, uh, may think that baseball rebellion and, and rotation, that's all I talk about, right? Rebels rack, blah, blah, blah. Um, give it a read, open your mind. And I think you're going to find that the rules of rotation really, really, really are applicable to how you hit, how you throw, whether it's baseball, whether it's softball. I mean, we work with golfers, we work a lot of different things. So there's a lot of people that can benefit from this book and my next book as well. So once again, Live with Chaz Pivot, so brought to you by Learn to Turn. Kurt from Ignite Baseball, thank you so much for being here. It was great to catch up. I love your facility, and uh, you got to give me some beard tips in the future. Hey, man, it just, it's falling from my head to my beard. That's how it goes. <laughs> All right, well, I appreciate everybody being here. Kurt, thanks so much, and I will see you next Wednesday, every Wednesday at 930 Eastern.